everyone. Welcome to the show. I'm Kim Parley. Great to have you with us tonight. People in the world's blue zones are more likely to live past their 100th birthday. So researchers looked at these areas and discovered common lifestyle and health and nutritional characteristics, which may contribute to their longevity. And not only do they tend to live longer, they tend to live better. Best-selling Blue Zones author Dan Butner joined me earlier at the Personal Performance Summit in Toronto, which was sponsored by TD Private Wealth Management. And he explained Blue Zones and what these cultures know that we don't. We call them Blue Zones areas. And it, it, they're less geography and more a culture in time because they're almost all disappearing right now. But uh, the longest-lived men in the world we found in the highlands of Sardinia, longest lived women in Okinawa, Japan. Uh, island called Ikaria, Greece, off the coast of Turkey where they suffer almost no dementia. The Nicoya Peninsula of Costa Rica, l lowest rate of middle age mortality. And then in the United States and probably in Canada too, we found longevity among the Seventh Day Adventists who are conservative Christians. And what do they do? I mean, if you were to kind of look at some of these cultures specifically, what is happening in those cultures that aren't happening somewhere else? So there's a cluster of interconnected characteristics that, that uh, allow them to do the right things for long enough to not get a chronic disease. So some of those things are, they eat mostly a plant-based diet, but they eat a plant-based diet because their uh, environments are set up, their fruits and vegetables are cheapest and beans and grains and greens and nuts, cheapest and most accessible. Their, their most fantastic recipes are plant-based and they gather around these foods. So you start to see this cluster of social and environmental and ge geographical and economic all rally around the right foods. Mm. They have vocabulary for purpose, very important. People who know where they're going in life will live life with much less stress than those people who are rudderless in life. Um, they tend to have a circle of friends they can count on. Lonely people in this country uh, live about eight years less than the best connected people. We overlook that because there's nothing I can sell you around having a good social network. Uh, but, but being well connected is very important. They tend to be religious. Religious people live four to 14 years longer than non-religious people. Mm. I could go into why, but uh, I'm not a particularly religious person, but, but it seems to work. It's working for them. For them. <laughs> it works for them, it really does. Yeah. What about, um, I remember uh, one thing that you mentioned uh, about the interconnectedness and, and I think in Japan, and I think, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this right, mo moi? Moai. Moai, what yes. is moai? It's so huge. So when people are young in that country, uh, they're introduced to four or five other young people and together they make a commitment to each other to uh, travel through life and support each other. So when things go well, they share the rays or the good crop Conversely, when a parent dies or a child gets sick or you get divorced, they have a, a social network. And I spent a, a two evenings with five 97-year-olds, 102-year-olds rather, who've been together for 97 years as they drank sake and gossiped and, and uh, argued about who that hot guy liked best back in 1941. But the second day, one of, uh, one of the girls didn't show up and the other th four put their kimonos on, walked across the, the uh, village to check on her. Now, if she had fallen down, hit her head or broke her hip at age 102 and wasn't seen within a matter of hours, it'd be game over. Yeah. But here was a social construct that cost the government nothing, that cost an employer nothing, that cost them nothing that had them checking in on each other for an entire lifetime. And I think it's a far more important concept than we ever, than we ever give credit to in this country. So many people are lonely, especially as we implode into our devices. Uh, 20 years ago, the average North American had three good friends. We're now down to barely one good friend. As we be centrifuge out into the uh, suburbs and, and uh, spend more time in our cars and spend more time online, and, watching TV, we just aren't making the human connection that you and I are making right now. Tell me a bit about your, your, your book, uh, Blue Zones of Happiness. What, do you, what are the blue zones of happiness? Well, again, it's a concept. It's not yeah. really a place. So blue zones in general is a technique whereby we find the, uh, the measurably most extraordinary populations and then, in a sense, re reverse engineer what they do. So the blue zones longevity work was finding the longest lived and happiness was finding the statistically happiest places and then distilling what they do. 
And when it comes to happiness, the, the starting point is the realization that happiness is a meaningless term academically. You can't measure it. You can't measure it, you can't manage it. But um, internationally, uh, surveyors can measure life satisfaction. On a scale of one to 10, how satisfied are you with your life? And yeah. if you pool that question, it's very meaningful. Number two, your positive emotions in the last 24 hours, how much you laugh, smile, felt joy, felt stress, et cetera. And then third, your, your, your purpose. Do you get to use your strength to do what you do best every day? And that's measured internationally. And then the surveys ask um, 70 or 80 other questions about your demographics, your values, what you do with your life. So using, using this nifty statistical trick called a regression analysis, you can find out what sorts of behaviors associate with each of these three measurable facets of happiness. So what I did for Blue Zones of Happiness, and it's also a cover story for National Geographic for the November issue, is find the places around the world where they experience the highest life satisfaction, the highest daily positive emotion, and the highest sense of purpose. And then, because people like to be told a story. Yeah. I could drone on all day about statistics, your eyes would glaze over. Yeah. Everybody listening, their eyes would glaze over. But if I tell you a story of a guy in Costa Rica who wakes up every morning, spends eight hours a day interacting with his friends, he is, religion is very important to him, his sense of family is very important to him, and he's imbued with a sense of generosity. It sounds like a story of one person, but that, is, that correlates to about 80% of human happiness right yeah. there through that one character. So in terms of the book, you've gone to this place, you've told the story of you know, who this happy person is that, that represents all of this, and then reverse engineering. What do I, or someone who's reading it, want to take from this? Like, How can I change what I do? So if happiness were a cake recipe, yes. <laughs> uh, being with the right person, very important. Yeah. Uh, you need food, shelter, you need health care, you need some education, you need meaningful work. Uh, I think most of us like to have the feeling we can give back. But the most important ingredient in that recipe is where you live. It's the ingredient that has the most variability. So you take immigrants from places like Moldavia and move them to uh, Denmark, or you take people from Africa and move them to Canada. And this has been measured. John Hollywell, yeah. a Canadian economist, brilliant, nicest guy in the world too. He led this brilliant study that followed about 500,000 immigrants as they moved from less happy places to Canada, which is number seven in the world, by the way, one yeah. of the happiest places. And lo and behold, within about a year, their age stays about the same, their gender stays the same, their sexual preference stays the same. Yeah. Their education level stays about the same, and lo and behold, within one year, they start reporting the level of the seventh happiest place in the world. Huh. All they did was move. Right. I mean, it illustrates a point. So uh, if you want to get happier yourself, don't try to change your behavior. That is a recipe for neurosis. Focus on me, me, me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the self-help and remember this positive psychology technique. You never do. Yeah. You remember it for three weeks, and then, yeah. you, then you forget about it. Yeah. But if you shape your environment, emulate it from places that we know have the well-being outcome that we want, happiness ensues. It's not something we should pursue. It's something we shape our ecosystems so it pursues. You talked about emulating, uh, you know, for the individual in terms of how to, what, what can make you happy. What are some of the things you talk about in the book, the, some of the six ways you mentioned? So in Blue Zones of Happiness, I try to identify the domains that, we're, that we can shape in our lives. And one of them is our home. Happiest people are uh, socially interacting uh, five to six hours a day. So you want a home that invites that social interaction. So a front porch instead of a back deck. The sum of joyful moments is an important but often overlooked component to happiness. Um, so I actually got this idea from Ed Diener, but uh, Establishing a wall that you walk by a lot and putting pictures of your loved ones, your children, the awards you've gotten, your favorite place to vacation. So every time you walk by during the day, there's like, mm, mm, that counts. Uh, greenery, we're genetically hardwired to favor greenery. So if you can have a window that overlooks uh, green space, great. Uh, if not, making sure you have lots of house plants. It actually does work. In your financial life, this is important. If happiness is your goal, um, you're much better off to focus on your investments, to pay down your mortgage, buy insurance, or get an automatic savings plans 
than you are to consume something. Because if you buy a new green coat or a new gadget, that will give you a few months of satisfaction of utility, but then the novelty of that wears off. Whereas financial security lasts for years or decades, a much better investment in overall life satisfaction. Uh, when it comes to your social network, we often pick our friends based on expediency to, for our career, but actually you're better off finding a group of four or five friends who are happy themselves. Happiness is contagious. Um, for every new friend you add to, happy friend you add to your social network, it increases your own happiness by 15%. But you also want three friends that have the following criteria. Number one, you can have a meaningful conversation with them. Number two, you can call them on a bad day and they'll care. They don't just like you because you're a famous journalist. And number three, you actually like them. And you, you also kind of want them close because you want face-to-face -face conversation. But, but we just gloss over that. I mean, most of us, we just blunder through life and our friends are our friends. But proactively picking that moai that we talked about in this. And, and nurturing. And nurturing, yeah, because it doesn't come naturally in our culture. You've got to work for it here. So that, that's so important. We just so overlook that. Um, and then finally, I'll just say one more thing in your work life. So we often get that wrong. First of all, we spend most of our daily most of our waking hours working. It's so important. And I don't know how it is in Canada, but in the United States, only 30% of Americans actually like their job. The other 70 are showing up because they got to pay for crap. And, or they have some imagined financial goal that they think that'll bring them happiness. It usually doesn't. Um, so picking a job for passion over pay, and you've probably heard the $75,000 um, daily emotion flattens out at $75,000 a, a year. So if you can figure out a way to make about that, you don't even need that much. You only really need about $40,000 a year um, to cover your basic needs and to be able to treat yourself. By yourself, not kids here, but I mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and it depends where you live a little yeah. bit. You, um, but, um, but then to really be showing up at a job every day where you can use your strengths and uh, you're putting your passions to work. We see this in Denmark, by the way, which is the happiest place in the world. People uh, don't celebrate ambition there. They don't celebrate status. Uh, their needs are taken care of. They're taxed to the mean. So what do people do? They, they take on jobs they love and they spend all day making wonderful furniture and design and architecture and cool niche technology and stuff they really love. And they only work 36 hours and then they knock off and join a club. and. and pursue yet another passion. That's the way to live. Um, and then it, once you uh, get to work, the biggest determinant of whether or not you like your job, guess what it is? Uh, the people? Close. Your boss? Close, less close. Less close. The, the biggest determinant of whether or not you like your job, this comes from two million Gallup surveys, yeah. is do you have a best friend at work? Oh, yeah. So, so, and all the crap we focus on when we go to work, to first week you're there, find somebody who you share interest and value and proactively make that person your friend. And they might not become your best friend over, t over time or nurture three or four, but you really wanna be able to show up at work and feel like, yeah, somebody's got my back and I enjoy hanging with this person, not just work, 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 work. All right, fascinating interview with Mr. Butner. Uh, all the things you need to uh, pay attention to in terms of uh, personal happiness. Um, pretty, pretty shocking, actually, a few of them, but certainly something to pay attention to.